mean, I do feel like a lot of this is, you know, sort of in lieu of being able to block a nomination or block a confirmation, the goal is to just make sure that whoever is nominated has a giant asterisk next to their name. And then, you know, to sort of say that, you know, this asterisk is, um, you know, by default, it's like, no, it, it, it will only be there because you have decided to put it there. Alyssa, how's the news this week? Uh, Aaron, I'd call it less than fair to Midland. I don't know. <laughs> it's it's a yeah. On, on a scale of one to ten, it's about a three. Yeah, maybe three and a half. Maybe it's like three and a half in terms of goodness, not in terms of like direness or urgency. Correct. Correct. Yeah, so let's get into what's dire and urgent. Um, so, you know, right now, Roe v. Wade is is pretty much done, which we've been saying for quite some time. I know Three years. For Three years, years on this podcast. For, for, yeah. Since this podcast existed. Since yeah. Anthony Kennedy resigned, we were like, fuck, it's over. And uh, I think we were probably right. I take no pleasure in being right about that. But it seems pretty clear that the Supreme Court, uh, the 6-3 majority conservative Supreme Court, is going to gut Roe v. Wade um, when the uh, ruling comes down probably in June. So what is happening at the state level is Republican legislators are really getting horny about restricting abortion in their respective states as much as they possibly can with the anticipation that Roe will fall and their laws will actually be able to go into effect. Um, So we have, uh, I'm going to just list a few of these states. Nebraska um, is, has uh, introduced a new, uh, a new bill to ban all abortions. If the, if Roe v. Wade falls Um, it's, I don't know. Do you think Roe v. Wade is going to fall and like all abortions can be banned? Do you think that's going to be something that can happen? Or do you think they're going to try to split the difference and be like some abortions can be banned? I think they're I think it's going to be a split. The It's going to be a they're going to try to half measure it, I think, because mostly I just feel like they don't want to be protested or something. You know what I mean? Like, I I don't know. I don't know. I'd like to think they're going to half measure it, but God knows what they could actually do. Yeah. I mean, the thing that I was thinking about is, um, you know, Nebraska is is doing is doing this. Uh, Florida has yeah. also introduced um, a law that seems more like it will actually be able to go into effect because um, they are banning abortions after 15 weeks, which is, I right. believe, what the Miz- Mississippi law that is in question yep. in the in the case before the Supreme Court bans it at. Arizona has uh, introduced the Arizona Heartbeat Act, which mimics that crazy Texas law that banned abortion anytime cardiac activity can be detected in a fetus. By the way, that that little flicker, the six week, that's not a heart. That is a that is cardiac activity. And I think that right. mischaracterizing it as a heart really gives fuel to the anti-abortion uh, fire. There's also anti-abortion legislation on, uh, you know, on the table in Nebraska, Ohio, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Indiana is going to call a special session if Roe v. Wade falls to legislate uh, women's bodies. Um, Alyssa, why do you think they're calling this 15 weeks thing a compromise? Do you think that they're trying to sell this as something that isn't insane? Yeah, of course. They want to be like, like sometimes there's actually no such thing as compromise. There's like right and wrong. And in this instance, it's right and wrong. And no, they want to be like, see, America, we're here. We're trying to work with these crazy fringe lunatics, but they won't even come to the table on this 15 weeks. So no, I definitely think they're trying to sound like they're somehow reasonable and and here for it when like, fuck off. <laughs> Just fuck off. Yeah, I, the 15 weeks thing seems like it's an attempt to seem reasonable given yeah. the established, like what they've established the parameters of the argument, which is that the current state of affairs is uh, is unreasonable, which is uh, abortions can't be restricted up to the point of viability unless it's in the interest of the state, which states have really pushed and pushed and pushed um, versus the other side of it. They've decided that the other side of the argument is no abortions for anyone after fetal cardiac activity can be detected, which is not what the other side of the the debate is. Right. The other side of the debate is abortions can be regulated. They're right. trying to paint it as though the other side is uh, all abortions are banned. And so allowing this Mississippi law in Dobbs uh, versus Jackson Women's Health, allowing this 15 week ban to go into effect will appear to be a compromise to the public. Do not fall for it. 
It Do is not, not for it. Not a fucking compromise. All of these Republican chuckle fucks across the country are trying to line up to have it so that women in their states, people who are pregnant in their states who do not want to give birth, cannot access the reproductive health care that they need. They're making it their business and it is fucking bullshit. And this is why statewide elections matter. This yep. is why it's really important to pay attention to, you know what, try switching off MSNBC. Not you, Alyssa. I know that you pay attention to your state you know and local me. politics. But switch off MSNBC, switch off CNN, and read your nearest local newspaper. Read whoever is on the your state capital beat. Read up on what is going on in your state because that is where these laws are going to affect your life. If a federal abortion, if a federal uh, protections of abortion are struck down, your state is where your rights are dictated. So you got to pay attention. Speaking of the Supreme Court. Oh. Speaking of the Supreme Court, um, President Biden has pledged to nominate a black woman, a black justice, and um, to replace Justice Stephen Breyer, who is retiring. What are some of the more interesting public statements that you've seen on this move, Alyssa? Okay, so many, Aaron. So the one, so the one that actually struck me the most because I never really know what he's doing was when Lindsey Graham said that elections have consequences and you know, and he actually spoke to how one of the nominees who is who a potential rumored nominees who is from South Carolina, Michelle Childs, was like eminently qualified. I was like, what is this? What is this even happening here? But mostly his colleagues have been like, what a political move. What a political move by Biden to say that he's going to nominate a black woman. And this was a campaign promise. And therefore, everything about this this process now is political. And it's like, fuck off. What are you even talking about? What are you even talking about? Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, Amy Coney Barrett, like their indignation is, is trash. And they, I mean, it's just, nobody should even replay what they are saying uh, or report on it because it is, unless the sentence starts as in another hypocritical move, dot, dot, dot. It is not a serious argument, and it is being put forth by people who are not serious people. It is like it's ridiculous for them to immediately come out and deride Biden's choice. There are there are many female black judges and jurists who are exceptional and would do a, do a great job on the Supreme Court. And to come out immediately and say, like, this person is going to be a radical is crazy. You know who right. does have like a machine and a vetting process in place to vet justices to make sure that they only will do certain things when they reach the Supreme Court? Fucking Republicans do. Hello. The, the Federalist Society is their whole vetting mechanism. No justice, no conservative justice has been appointed to the Supreme Court in recent memory without being approved by the extremely conservative Federalist Society. So, like, Democrats don't have that machinery in place. It is more projection by conservatives. Um, I, I personally, the thing that really gets to me is the implication that a black woman wouldn't be qualified because she's just being chosen because she's black. Well, what about all of the white? You think all of the white men who were on the court, every single one of them was not chosen because they were white men? Like the implication is that white men have the qualifications and capacity and people who are not white men are somehow being given a favor. Um, it, It just... Well, and the other thing too, Erin, that's like that I have been frustrated with in the reporting when people are trying to like both sides this is that there is a huge difference between Joe Biden saying he is going to nominate or or even during the campaign saying he would nominate a black woman to the Supreme Court so that the fucking Supreme Court looks like the country that it legislates or govern, whatever the fuck word would be, makes laws for. That that is so radically different than Trump saying that he would only appoint pro life justices. There is a difference between saying that the that the bench should look like America, and between saying that you will only appoint people who will absolutely 
uh, Aaron, what is the word? I cannot find the word from jurist. Like, to, <laughs> what do they do? Make a law that would, they would only they would they only rule. rule. Thank you. <laughs> that would oh my god. That would only rule a certain way uh, uh, without nuance is essentially what Trump was saying on these policy issues. So it's so it's so hypocritical and gross and not the same thing. And also Reagan, uh, when he was running for president, said that he would nominate a woman during his campaign. So like, why is that different than this? It's just. Aaron, it's just more jiggery pokery on part yeah. of the Republicans. Absolutely. And I think that anybody who brings up the like, oh, affirmative action, blah, 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 is, like I said, not a person who is being serious and not a person to be taken seriously. Okay. Alyssa, do you know why I dressed up for this podcast today? I think I have an idea, but please tell me. I've got a red lip on and a white canvas jumpsuit because the person that we are talking to today is one of the most astute, sharp, smart voices in fashion criticism, and I do not want to get red. So <laughs> joining us today is Robin Given. She is a senior editor at large for The Washington Post, where she's covered the intersection of fashion, culture, and politics. She has also authored several books, including The Battle of Versailles, The Night American Fashion, Stumbled into the Spotlight and Made History. And in 2006, she was the first fashion critic to earn a Pulitzer Prize for criticism. And also, she's a writer that I've looked up to since before I was a writer. So welcome. Welcome to Hysteria, Robin. Thank you so much for having me. And I fear that I've really let you down because I'm wearing a hoodie. <laughs> Don't, oh, but you look you're awesome. In, you're in good company over here, <laughs> also in a hoodie. See, the critic doesn't need to dress to like you're the you're the fashion critic. You don't need to dress up. You can just like take a look at me and be like, she looks fine. She looks OK. <laughs> and that's enough for me. <laughs> I want to start this conversation by talking about your most recent piece, which posted on Tuesday. Your most recent piece is about President Biden's soon to be announced Supreme Court nominee. Uh, he's fulfilling a promise he made on the campaign trail, which is that he's going to nominate a black woman to serve on the court. And that's caused a I think to use a technical term, a shit fit among conservative uh, white yeah. men. So why do you think that people like Ted Cruz are so upset about this promise? Well, you know, I think to some degree they're upset because they're always upset about something. Um, you know, the, the world as it changes and evolves just seems to have caused them or is causing them uh an incredible amount of agita, and this is just sort of adding to it. Um, but I, I also think that the fact that, um, you know, Biden said that it's time for a Black woman to serve on the Supreme Court, it's beyond time for that to happen, and that he made a point of being quite intentional about that, I, I think has just caused them to start down this road that, I mean, I hesitate to use the word racist, but certainly has um, troubling racial stereotypes attached to uh, their language. Um, and I, I think it's just sort of drawing out this incredible fear of the ways in which the culture is changing and the ways in which the power structure is shifting so that it's not solely in the hands of white men. And I think all of those fears have unleashed a kind of illogic and, um, and, 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 a, and a fear that is just really troubling. Yeah, I wanted to read a little um, excerpt from the piece uh, because I thought it was so great. You wrote, when Trump promised to nominate a woman to fill the seat left vacant by Ginsburg, that decision was greeted with a nod and polite applause. During Justice Amy Coney Barrett's confirmation in 2020, conservatives repeatedly referenced her seven children. They marveled at her ability to balance her maternal responsibilities with her professional accomplishments, and they oozed admiration for her devotion to family. They planted her atop a pedestal of divine femininity, a kind of glorification that rarely shines on black women. I thought that was really great. I was imagining if uh, Biden nominated a black woman with seven children, the way that Ted Cruz would respond to that. I, I shudder to think the way that Ted Cruz would respond to that. I mean, I, you know, it, it really does the when you when I hear those responses, it makes me question a lot of things about um, you know, who they surround themselves with, 
who they think they are representing, who their constituents are, who they think they are delighting with comments like that. I, I mean, it is, I mean, it's really astonishing to me that they can actually look back over the history of the court, look back over history from barely two years ago and act so shocked and appalled about uh, you know Biden's decision and the necessity to a great degree um, for that kind of decision. And you know, and I'm also just sort of struck was really struck by the just the sheer disingenuousness of so much of it. I mean, you know, Senator Susan Collins getting, you know, like, you know, all of her concerns in a, uh, in a huff <laughs> over, you know, the sudden politicization of a Supreme Court nomination. It, I, I listened to it and I just thought the degree to which you're contorting yourself in order to oppose what at this point is still an unnamed nominee. It's just remarkable to me. I mean, I just thought, why not just hold your ire until you actually have someone that you can be offended by? But instead, I I mean, I do feel like a lot of this is you know, sort of in lieu of being able to block a nomination or block a confirmation, the goal is to just make sure that whoever is nominated has a giant asterisk next to their name. And then, you know, to sort of say that, you know, this asterisk is, um, you know, by default, it's like, no, it, it, it will only be there because you have decided to put it there. Robin, you've written a lot on first ladies and female politicians. What's the difference between sexist commentary on how a woman looks and relevant commentary on the political message clothing sense? So how many different senators put you up to that question? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I would say that the difference is that I hope in my writing about – attire and appearance, um, you know, I try to keep to what I think the messages are and the the communication capacity of attire is. Um, You know, I have always said that, you know, my sort of rules of of engagement when it comes to writing about appearance, um, you know, are to focus on those things that people make conscious decisions about. And they make conscious decisions about how formally they want to be dressed, about whether or not, uh, you know, certainly for male politicians, um, whether or not they're going to take off that suit jacket and roll up the sleeves, which, you know, I have always said is sort of the universal um, symbol of I'm about to speak earnestly to you now. (laughs) Um, You know, I think all of those gestures go into the whole sort of stage play of politics. Um, You know, I don't write about, you know, people's weight and the size of their nose and, you know, things like that. And believe me, I have gotten emails from readers who have said, oh, you know, why don't you write about, you know, how heavy so-and-so and and -and so-and-so is or, you know, or how someone is just unattractive in their um, estimation. To me, that's when you get into completely unfair territory and it doesn't have anything to do with anything. You extensively covered the Obamas during their eight years in the White House. How did you see the conversation around fashion, in particular Michelle Obama's fashion, um, in the context of first ladies of the past? And what did you make of Melania Trump's fashion in comparison? Well, when um, the Obamas were uh, in the White House, I uh, was covering Michelle Obama in like a very uh, official capacity. I mean, my beat was um, the East Wing um, for about a year and a half. And, you know, it was a great time to write about the First Lady because essentially everything was a historical moment. It was a first And, um, you know, it was interesting to see the way that the culture responded to her, um, the way that she engaged with the culture, how she began her sort of rollout as as first lady with something quite 
as as she you know later put it, something that was you know quite um, humble and hopefully uncontroversial. A garden, I planted a garden, <laughs> um, and you know it just sort of all began from there. And she was, I thought, really masterful in the way that she used fashion. Um, I mean, she I think recognized that you know part of what is attached to the first lady is interest in her attire. And, you know, that's for a multitude of reasons, um, not the least of which is that so often she um, doesn't have a speaking role. She is in the picture as a symbol of of something, you know, sort of a Rorschach uh, symbol, if you will. And so her, the clothes speak volumes. And I, I, I love the fact that she decided that if there was going to be a spotlight on my clothing, I want my clothing to say something that is, um, that is thoughtful and is articulate and, you know, sometimes may be full of just sort of delight and charm and sometimes is about diplomacy and sometimes is about diversity and inclusivity. I mean, I, I think her her clothing set, it was great. It was absolutely great. And there was a reason um, why the fashion industry absolutely adored her. And it was because she was a free ranging fashion consumer. You know, I mean, she wore everyone from the most established designers to people that, you know, about five people had heard of. And that delighted them. And she treated the fashion industry like an industry that was contributing to the cultural conversation and to the economy. And, um, you know, it's been really hard for First Ladies, um, you know, previously to do that, because they often, I think, felt um, that if they did pay too much attention to their clothes, they everything else would just sort of get smothered by fashion commentary. I know, you asked me about Melania Trump. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I wasn't writing so much about the, the First Lady at that point, but, um, you know, my thoughts about Melania were that, one, she dressed very much for herself um, as opposed to this idea of representing the sort of vastness and the nuances of American culture. You know, she dressed to be photogenic. I always felt that she was very much sort of treating each public event like a photo op and was thinking about her angles and was thinking about how is this going to look, you know, in, in the history books. Um, she felt no deep compunction to wear uh, American designers, um, and she felt no obligation to elevate lesser-known um, American brands. And for me, I think when she wore that infamous Zara coat um, that said, you know, I, I really don't care to you, to me, that was just kind of this nuclear fashion option in which she just sort of, you know, used her clothing to like spray everyone within like 50 yards of her. Um, and, you know, at, at that point, I think everything else that she wore, you know, got smothered out by that one garment. Robin, who do you think is the most fashionable politician right now? That's an in, that's an interesting question. Well, you know, I <laughs> I, I have um, a, a couple of, of friends who are men's wear stylists, and they can attest to the fact that I have been um, just very weirdly obsessed with President Biden's pocket squares. <laughs> and I, I don't know, it's it's a sickness, it's a distraction. I can't really fully explain it. But I 
am so delighted in that pocket square because it is so precisely folded. It is always white. It has three peaks. <laughs> and it's like he pulls it out when, you know, he is being very serious about something. And I, to me, it just is this little added flourish, this little detail that is so old school um, and requires just a little bit of extra effort. Um, and and I think it just sort of also reminds me of um, sort of men of like my father's generation who sort of felt like, um, you know, dressing up and dressing in a very polished way was kind of this, this sign of respect for the situation and for themselves. And, um, and I sort of love that he doesn't shy away from it because it is a bit of a, an old school thing to do. And clearly I have given way too much thought to this pocket square. <laughs> is, is, there, is there anybody whose fashion choices routinely make you cringe? Well, I mean, come on. I mean, the obvious <laughs> one is, you know, Senator Cinema, whose choices just baffle me, be- mostly because I think the technical term would just be they're out of the norm. Um, they're far afield from traditionally what we think of as sort of business attire. And even as she's wearing these things that are so far afield, her response is, why on earth are you looking at my clothes and discussing my clothes? I find it somewhat hypocritical because it's a bit like, you know, setting your hair on fire and then saying, why are you sending fire trucks over here? Like, what's the problem? <laughs> uh, well, your uh, assessment of cinema's fashion is much more restrained than mine, but we, I think, agree. Um, there are still some people in publications who kind of cordon off fashion criticism into this unserious or like for women corner. What sort of meaningful commentary and analysis do you think these people are missing out on by discounting fashion? Well, I don't think they're really seeing the world that's in front of them. And I don't think they're taking advantage of the full vocabulary that we have to communicate with each other. I also think that they're sort of failing to see um, the inherent sexism in that. Um, You know, I am, I often compare sort of fashion coverage and sports coverage and the ways in which, um, you know, we approach sports coverage is with an incredible amount of gravity. And, um, you know, the fact that we attach patriotism to a baseball game or a football game. And we don't see, you know, the connection that fashion has to, or we don't, we we often fail to see um, the connection that fashion has to um, who we are and how we define ourselves, how we want to be seen by other people, the ways in which fashion can really um, send false messages or make us, um, you know, fall prey to stereotypes. Um, You know, I have just, you know, things like hoodies and work boots. And, you know, I mean, there are so many just garments that have all of these emotions and historical references and stereotypes attached to them. And I think if we don't really consider that and understand it, then we end up making the same incorrect assumptions over and over and over again. Um, And, you know, and the other thing I would say is that, you know, when I first came to Washington, I was surprised by the number of women that I met who uh, enjoyed fashion, but really, you know, said that they refrained from talking about it um, publicly as if having a conversation about it was sort of immediately going to sort of lower their IQ by several points. And, you know, someone like much smarter than me, um, you know, once said that we should not diminish the, um, the pleasures that women take in their personal lives 
because that diminishes women. And so why we, you know, want to belittle fashion when it's so much um, like the passion of predominantly women, although increasingly, you know, more men for sure, um, you know, I think says something about the way that we value the joys and pursuits of women. Robin, thank you so much. Listeners, if you want to read more of Robin Givens' work, you can find her work at the Washington Post. Thanks for joining us. Yay!